All right, so in the next few videos, we're going to introduce the idea of a change of variables um, for multiple integrals in calculus four. Um, so the, the setup here is we're going to be looking at these special types of functions which are called transformations. Uh, now, uh, we only really look at double and triple integrals. So for us, the n here in Rn is generally going to be two or three. It could be more. Um, but not in this class. Uh, the region D that we're working over generally is going to be closed and bounded. Okay, So it's a closed bounded region, the type that you might try to integrate over. And what we do in a change of variables, we apply the transformation, is we we apply the transformation to this domain D, and T is going to take the domain D and it's going to turn it into another region, uh, typically more complicated than the one that we started with. Um, there are a number of conditions that a function has to satisfy to be a transformation. Um, it has to be C1, so it has to be continuously differentiable. Okay? We want it to be a one-to-one -one function. I'll try to explain visually why this matters um, before we even get into integration. And, and there's this condition on uh, this function here. So we mentioned this in the context of uh, talking about the spherical coordinate change of variables, which, by the way, is an example of a transformation, that this function j sub t, uh, this is known as the Jacobian of the transformation. And it's the function that you obtain when you take the determinant of the matrix of partial derivatives for your transformation. Uh, so you ask that this determinant be, be non-zero, uh, which is essentially, uh, if you think back to your linear algebra for a second, remember that if you ask for the determinant of a square matrix to be non-zero, you're essentially requiring that that matrix has to be invertible, right? Um, so if you, think of, if you think of the derivative of a transformation as a linear transformation, right, the, the, the linear function that approximates the original transformation, uh, this requirement here is saying that not only does the, the original transformation have to be one to one, but also sort of the linear part of that transformation, if you do the linear approximation, think about kind of something like a degree one Taylor polynomial approximation, you can make sense of that. Um, that also has to be one to one. It has to be invertible, right? Uh, transformations defined by invertible matrices are, are one to one. Um, okay, uh, so there's this, this requirement of being one to one. Um, so wh where does that requirement come from? Well, the, the idea is that you know, what you want to think of here is this is the sort of general picture that we have in mind, okay? The general picture that we have in mind it's, it's actually, it, it seems a little bit backwards. What's going to happen is there's going to be some, some region over here. And, and maybe it looks kind of complicated, right? Maybe it looks something like this. Okay. I mean, that doesn't look so bad, right? But, and maybe we call this thing, we call this region E. And we look at that thing, we say, well, you know what, if I was trying to set up a, you know, a double integral over this region, right, here's my, this is my, my x, my x, y plane, okay, I, I would not enjoy setting up this integral, right, because you can see that if you try to integrate first with respect to, um, to x, well, you're going to have to kind of, you know, you're going to have one set of bounds from here to here, and then another set of bounds from well, and, th and then here, you know, like there's some stuff that goes on, like that's going to be a tricky region to integrate over, right? And it's going to be just as tricky if you're integrating uh, first with respect to y. Um, so the, the thought process is you say, well, that, that region, it kind of looks like, it, it, it looks a little bit like kind of a melted rectangle. It looks like a rectangle that kind of got pulled and stretched a little bit. And so you say, well, you know, maybe, maybe what we can do is we can come up with a function. We can come up with this transformation that goes from here to here. And over here, this is going to be 
sort of a UV space. So we, we almost look at things a little bit backwards, right? It's like a change of variables. It's like when you do a U substitution for a single integral, right? Um, rather than just writing X as a function of U, um, we're going to write X and Y as functions of U and V. Um, actually, even that's a little bit backwards because when you do single integral substitutions, you usually write U as a function of X. Um, if we have time, we'll talk about that. Um, but the, the goal, the hope is that over here, You might have a reasonably simple region, maybe even a rectangle, right? Best case scenario, you've got like a rectangle, something reasonably straightforward. And, and then you say, okay, you know, if I can figure out a way to kind of, you know, the idea is, you know, I have an integral over here. And it's defined over here. So we're gonna, the integral is going to be defined over here. And, and what we really want is we want the integral to be computed here, right? We want to do the calculations over in a different space where the calculations are easy, right? Where they're, and remember that the, the thing that makes double integrals and triple integrals much harder than single integrals is it's not necessarily the function that you're integrating that makes the problem hard, it's the region you're integrating over that makes things hard, right? This is a difficult region to integrate over, um, assuming I knew what these functions were that make up the boundary. Right? Rectangles, rectangles are easy, right? In principle, I can integrate any function over any rectangle, as long as the function is continuous on that rectangle. Okay? So, so basically what you're going to do, um, and in, in kind of more advanced courses, not this one, uh, there's some language for this. You would talk about kind of taking this integral over here and using a map like this to kind of take this problem and pull it back. So there's something called a pullback that kind of takes this problem, brings it back over here where it's simpler. This is the idea. This is the problem that you want to do. Um, and so the way, the way you have to tie this together is you have to understand, well, when you apply this transformation, right, um, we know that we th if we're thinking about double integrals, we think about, you know, Riemann sums. We think about having some kind of a grid, right? And we have to think about how does a little area over here get transformed when we send it over here, right? How does a, how does a little rectangle inside my big rectangle, what happens to that? Well, that little rectangle, that's probably going to turn into, you know, something like that over there. And you need to know how much does the area change when I go from here to there, right? And how much does that change in area depend on where in the rectangle I happen to be, right? I need that change of in area to be given as a function of u and v. Um, and you might guess, because we've kind of seen this now in the context of polar and spherical coordinates, that the thing that computes this change of area is exactly this Jacobian. It's this determinant, right? And we already know for linear functions, we know for linear transformations, matrix multiplication, that if you want to know how much the area of a rectangle is, is, is changed when you apply a matrix, transform that rectangle into a parallelogram, you want to know the area of the parallelogram, well, you calculate the determinant of the matrix that you use to transform it. That's the general idea, okay? Um, so there, there are a lot of technical details, you know, that you might want to go through, and I don't think we want to do them all in the video. In particular, we might want to talk about, well, why do we put all these conditions in here? Um, we, can, we can discuss that if you want. Um, I did put a lot of those details in the textbook, so if you are interested, you can go and read up on it there. I think that allows me to, to skip on things a little bit in the, uh, in the video. Um, but what we'll, what we'll find is there... There is a formula. There is a change of variables formula. And it looks something like this. It'll say, well, if, you know, if T is a transformation, so if T going from D in, well, let's just do R2, just so I can simplify things. You can do this for R3 as well. If this is a transformation, all 
right? And, and so we're going to give it by, you know, x, y is equal to t of u, v, right? This is kind of what we want to, what we want to think about here. Um, and if e is the range of that transformation, so e is, is the image of d under the transformation, right? So it's e is the set of all points that you obtain by taking a point in d, plugging it into t, and seeing where you end up over here. Um, with this setup, and again with the usual kind of assumptions on continuity of the function you want to integrate and things like that, um, the integral over e of f of x, y, the area, is equal to the integral over d of f of t of u v times the Jacobian of t as a function of u and v and then integrate it with respect to u and v and you know whichever order happens to be con convenient. Uh, there's one thing I have to do, this is not quite right yet, there's one modification. Um, you have to, if, if you want to kind of write the formula as I've written it, you have to put in one more condition, which is you have to restrict yourself to what are called orientation preserving transformations, right? Um, and the, the issue is that well, this, this Jacobian, right, you know, this is, is defined as a determinant. One of the things that we know about a determinant is that if you switch two rows, you get a minus sign, right? Well, switching two rows in this determinant amounts to more or less the order in which you choose to write down your variables, either here or there, right? Um, reversing the variables is kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a reversing your orientation. It's kind of like if you flip the variables, it's like you're looking at the plane from underneath instead of above. Um, so there's this change in orientation. Um, you don't want to have to worry about whether you wrote your variables down in the correct order. Um, and if you wrote them down in the wrong order, well, you're off by a minus sign. And we know how to get rid of minus signs. You just take an absolute value. Okay. So that's what the change of variables formula looks like for a general transformation um, going from R2 to R2. If this was R3 to R3, well, then this is now a triple integral. This is x, y, z. This is u, v, w. Um, otherwise, it looks the same. Okay? Um, that's the theorem. We'll, uh, we'll go over some of the details uh, as we work through a couple of examples. We're going to do, I think, two examples, not too many on this, uh, to try and, and, and explain how things work. Um, one of the general principles that you want to keep in mind if you're trying to do a change of variables, right, and especially if you're not given the transformation, right, because a big part of the game in these problems is somebody just hands you this region and an integral, right? You're just given this and you're told, all right, do the integral. It's your job to come up with the change of variables, right? Like in Calc 1, you're not told what the substitution is, except maybe at the very beginning. You got to figure it out. Um, well, one of the things that you can prove, and the proof is, is in the textbook, I put it in there, um, is that uh, a transformation, if it satisfies these properties, it always takes boundary points to boundary points. Um, and, and even more, more to the point, um, edges go to edges, corners go to corners. Okay? And, and so this gives you some clues often as how to, how to define the transformation. So often what, what you find is that that you might find that, that these boundary pieces here might be given by, say, um, maybe like a g of x, y is equal to um, like a. And, and this is another curve in the same family, right? So these both belong to some family of, of level curves. And the other sides, they happen to belong to this some other family. So this might be something like h of x, y equals maybe d. And this side is, is h of x, y is equal to, say, c, right? So if you can look at your region and you realize, hey, this, you know, that, that I have this function of x and y, which, which varies between c and d. I have this other function of x and y, which varies between a and b. Um, well, 
this gives you a clue. This says, hey, you know what? I should probably try a transformation that looks, you know, um, hmm, what are we going to do? Well, you're still going to have to play around, right? Um, basically, what you're going to do is you're going to say, hey, I'm going to define you to be um, g of x, y. I'm going to define v to be h of x, y. Um, and, and this is kind of a curious thing. In some ways, this is what you do when you do a change of variables for, for a single integral, uh, right? Um, you, you define a new variable in terms of the old one, right? And here, here we're defining two new variables in terms of the old ones. Um, but this doesn't actually give me t. Um, what this gives me is this actually gives me the inverse. It gives me t inverse. It gives me the inverse to the transformation that I want, right? Um, which is why you want your transformation to be one to one, right? If you want, if you want a function to have an inverse, it had better be one to one, right? And, and also, um, if you want to kind of, you know, take the derivative of the inverse um, and you want it to be one to one, well, even not necessarily one to one, one of the things you might remember is that there's a relationship between um, the determinant of a matrix and its inverse, right? The determinant of an inverse is one over the determinant of the original matrix. So why do you need to make sure that this determinant is non-zero? Well, because the determinant of this one, the, the derivative of this one is one over the determinant of that one. You don't want to divide by zero. You just, usually you don't. Um, so, so all these conditions, they do come into play. Uh, we'll, we'll see in some examples how this is all pieced together, and maybe we'll even try to think about how this fits into a, to a Calc 1 example um, if we have time. But uh, we'll stop here. This has gone on, I think, long enough, this video. Um, and it's all kind of general, kind of conceptual, technical stuff. Uh, it's time for us to look at an example.